Today, I'm going to talk about what arrived in the mail this week. Spoiler alert, it's not yarn. I'm going to talk about, remember how Craig Ferguson used to do like, talk about a new work in progress. I'm going to bring you up to date on this and a couple other things. So stick around. Is this your first time here? I would like to know if you knit from vintage patterns, vintage inspired patterns, or maybe you don't knit at all. It would be fun for me to know what everybody else is working on because I'm about to share with you a bunch of projects that I'm working on. I wanted to give a shout out to one of my big fans, Colette. Hi, Colette. She sent me a link to an article in an Australian newspaper called The Guardian about generations of women who knit and who pass their knitting down to other members of their family. So I'll leave a link in the show notes and you can go and take a look at that. Thanks for sending it my way, Colette. Usually I'm a monogamous knitter, but as it happens today, I have a few things to show you, not my usual one or two. I'm still trying to always be monogamous, but I give myself the gift of a new cast on whenever I complete a project and behind me is an FO. Therefore, there's a new cast on my neck of the woods. Cast on number 12 and action. Yes, you heard me right. Cast on number 12. I lost track after a while, but I cast on this new project at least a dozen times. So I want to explain to you what's going on with that. Let's kick the hour off with that. Oh, you know, I forgot to mention, I'm not wearing a sweater today because if you've been watching the US Open, then you will clearly know that it's been in the 90s with high humidity. Right now it's 93 degrees according to my computer. So it's, Enough that I knit this entire sweater jacket over the summer. Elephant in the room, I'll come back and talk about that. If you go back to last fall's Rhinebeck episode, and I'll put a link up in the corner for you, you'll remember that I fell in love with this yarn. Not only because it's chenille and because it's very thin, Often chenille is very chunky, but the color, can we talk about the color? Have you ever seen anything more beautiful than that? There were only two skeins like this, 200 yards each. It says its birth date was October 12th, 2018 by a company called Artisanal Yarns. I stumbled upon them at Rhinebeck. They had a big outdoor, I can't even call it a booth. It was like a space with cardboard boxes just overflowing with all sorts of yarns. And they had racks of yarns. It was a mashup. It was intended to be a mashup because these were bargain basement prices. I bought a very small skein of a dark brown, like a chocolatey brown yarn that I intended for the sweater that I knit for my son but for myself I bought this you'd have to go back to that episode maybe I paid three or four dollars for each skein but since it was only 200 yards times two 400 yards I really struggled to find a pattern to work with this um, I didn't want to do a scarf. I didn't want to do a hat. I really wanted it to be a garment that would be mm, just surrounding me in this beautiful violet color. So this is what I came up with. So this is a 1930s pattern. I thought the fact that there's all this open work might help me to use less yarn. And because it is two-tone, I thought if I'm running out of this yarn, I could add in a second color. And I have something that I picked up at Vogue Knitting Live. Um, it was a sample given to me so I could knit the guy up a swatch and I got to keep the rest of the sample. So it's a very pretty peachy 
color that I think would be very pretty with this. Anyway, this is the pattern in question. Now, I want you to notice these vertical columns and all this open work. It's not clear if she's wearing something underneath it. It looks like she might be wearing a slightly darker bra. Um, depending on how open the open work is, I might be able to get away with nothing underneath it. But I started on a fairly substantial size needle, I think a size nine or 10, using my chalgoos. Well, those needles did not at all agree with this yarn. There was no harmony between them. The stitches were slipping and sliding and I kept seeing these loops forming. So I thought, I don't know what that's about. Maybe if I'm using a wooden needle, it will grip a little better. So my wooden needles are also pretty slick. I started with the same size needle and these loops still kept popping out. I'm going to show you what I'm currently knitting just so you can see sort of what I'm talking about. I got rid of all my swatches. They were just irritating to me. But see that loop at the top? It should be flat. I don't want things, or like that one. I don't want all these little loopy things popping out. So I kept trying different needle sizes, but I thought, I, you know, I want these holes to be big enough so that they're even visible. You know, if, if it's really, really tight gauge, like on a size one or two needle, you're not going to see that hole and you won't get that vertical striping effect. So as it turns out, I kept going down, going down needle size until I finally struck upon one where there just wasn't going to be enough extra yarn here to go anywhere. I'm down to a size six needle at this point. And I think that's probably where I'm going to stay. Maybe, maybe I'll go down to a size five. All I can tell you is I cast on many, many times, partly because of the way the pattern is written. The pattern was a four row repeat and it seemed like the number of stitches in the repeats were different on row two and on row four. Well, after I tried multiple times and I kept coming to the end of the row and I had like an extra stitch or two hanging out, I just got fr so frustrated. I said, oh, forget it. And I went online and I looked for a stitch dictionary that would have a similar kind of columnar open work effect. And I looked at that pattern and it was different than the one that I was using and it clearly had a six stitch repeat. And I thought, okay, good. And I could see that on both the rows, this is only a two row repeat. I could see on both the rows, the repeat is always within six stitches. So if you're a lace knitter, you'll know that it's highly advisable to put stitch markers where you have that repeat. So you can always see if you have the right number of stitches between those markers. So if I ever, turn up with having only five stitches in between these two or seven stitches, I know I've gone astray and I can fix it before I proceed. Because of the nature of this yarn, it's kind of grippy. So it sticks to itself kind of like velvet would stick to itself. Maybe that's where Velcro came from, sticks to itself. This kind of does that too. So you have to be super careful with each loop that you make that you kind of pull it through. But even when I pull it through tightly, I'm still getting these loops. And sometimes everything will look like it's in place. And then five minutes later, out of nowhere, a loop appears. I think I have it to the point where it's looking pretty good. Oh, well, there's that over there. I'll have to see what I can do about that one. Um, it's almost like, you know, snags or pulls. And this is nothing 
that's the wrong side, by the way. This is the right side. I should show you that because there's nothing looping out on this side. It was almost like, you know, you got caught on a hanger or something and it pulled. You hate when that happens, right? This does seem like it's going to be susceptible to that, which is why I might go down even further on my needle size. But for right now, I am calling this, because it's a pattern that doesn't have a name, I'm calling it swizzle stick because that seemed like 1930s kind of cocktail reference. Um, this is the treat that I gave myself because I have a finished object. Yes, I finished the Carol Feller Dacite. I finished it in no time, if you notice, because the last time you saw me, I think I was up to here and I hadn't knit the sleeves at all. And I hadn't done the contrasting color around the collar. I was going to do the contrasting color on the cuffs and around the bottom, but I decided to just go with the whole thing being charcoal gray. I thought it was really much more classic look. I was kind of going for a 1940s vibe, very streamlined, very clean and simple. Um, so Tell me what you think. Did I achieve that look? Let me put it on for you. Yeah, that's why I'm wearing something very lightweight so I could slip it on and show you. I do have the air conditioning on, but it's still not sweater weather inside my apartment. Okay, so here you go. I think the sleeves are really perfect length. I love how everything about it looks. And I don't have a button on yet. There's two buttonholes here, which if I don't put buttons, you won't see those buttonholes. One of the really super great things about this pattern is it's knit from the top down. You start at this end and you knit all the way down to the bottom and then you pick up the stitches for the sleeves and knit the sleeves down. It's all knit in one solid piece. There's zero seams and I was able to try it on all along the way. As you know, mostly I'm knitting from vintage, no vintage pattern that I've seen is knit like that. Most things are knit in pieces, sleeves are separate, and usually there's a fitted shoulder. This has raglan, which I kind of like because I don't have a really well-defined shoulder. So I think this kind of emphasizes shoulder for me a little bit, maybe gives me shoulder that I don't have. I don't know. I just think it's it's nice looking. I wouldn't want everything to be like that, but for a change, it's great. Um, and there's a nice kind of little detailing in the raglan. It's subtle, but it's there. And maybe you can see it better there. I had a, a pretty good, easy time getting um, what I think is a, a nice fit. I haven't blocked it because Really, I don't think it needs blocking. Everything about it just seemed to fall right into place beautifully for me. So at some point after I've worn it around a bit, I'll want to give it a wash and then I'll I'll see if I can smooth out some of those areas. But uh, the yarn. This is the yarn that I bought at Les Tricoteurs Volant in Paris in January when I was there. Enrico, you did good, man. You hooked me up with not only a great color, but I was dubious about this yarn. I thought it's a little on the rustic side for me. Um, I have so many things that are gray. I was kind of hoping for some purple or some pretty shade of blue or something, but there it was. He had the right quantity. I do have a lot of gray in my wardrobe, so it's going to coordinate with a lot of things that I have, which is always good. You know, I can carry a black handbag, so I always have to worry about my accessories, shoes, and so forth. If I knit a purple jacket, what shoe am I wearing? A black shoe, I guess. 
black handbag yeah but then what's underneath it something that's green and blue you know what this is going to be more versatile for me so i am thrilled thrilled with the end product carol feller home run out of the ballpark i'm just so so happy with everything i did a little modification i made the jacket longer than the pattern called for let me see if i can back up more so it's coming below my hip i also did a little bit of waist shaping just so i wouldn't have too 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 much fabric and that was easy easy to accomplish because it's kind of you know straight thing so i think that helped me to get a, a better fit um she does have some darts i don't know if you can see them in the back which also helps not to have excess fabric let me get out of this <sighs> roasting I could say a little something about the the trim. She gives very good instructions not to do it in a contrasting color, but to do it in the same color as the body. Still, there's a provisional cast on, and then you come back and you do this trim. This trim that goes down the front, I don't know if you can see that, that is knit right in as you as you go it has a very similar look and feel to this so the detailing is really kind of couture i would say so really lovely pattern don't know if you can tell that this is all garter stitch and the sleeves are stockinette so I did do a little modification there. Of course, the sleeves are knit in the round. The cuff is knit in garter stitch. Now, if you have not knit garter stitch in the round, you might not know that it's not just knit and knit and knit and knit and knit because that's how you get stockinette if you're knitting in the round. To achieve garter in the round, you have to knit around and then curl around. So it's a little bit of a twist on what you do if you're knitting something flat. I found though, when I was doing a row of knit and then a, a round followed by a round of curl, I found that my garter stitch in the round was not giving me the same gauge as my garter stitch, with, which I had been knitting flat. I guess because here I'm doing knit and knit, here I'm doing knit and purl. And my purl, even though I don't row out, here's my stockinette, there's no rowing out on my purl side, not at all, but it must be at a slightly different tension than my knit. So my modification to get the same gauge and the same exact look was I knit this portion flat. All I did was I kept stitches on my circular needles, but I stopped at the end of the round and then I flipped it over and knit back. And when I got to the end, I flipped it over and I knit back just like you normally would if you're knitting something flat on a circular needle. So this was open. And then I came back and I mattress stitch just th that section. So that's how I got the same look and feel to my garter here. Other than that, it was a piece of cake. Loved it. Okay, moving along, let's open this package. Um, it's not knitting related, but it is vintage. So let me grab a pair of scissors one second. I ordered a vintage blouse online. It's very, very similar to a blouse that I own that's really good fitting. 
except that one is ivory in color and this one is pink. And I've waited until now to open it online with you. Let me try not to uh, cut into anything. It's such a great envelope. I would like to try and preserve it because I do like to, here we go. I, I do like to not waste precious resources. So if I can reuse something again, I try and do that. Okay, I don't use these scissors very often. They're not that great, but I think after this should release. Nailer wrapped in style. I this is I nailer wrapped in style. It's really beautiful bag. Oh, look. There are little flowers in here. One just fell off. Oh, but how sweet these are. I'm so glad I waited to open this with you. And this person had no clue that I'm a knitter. She wrapped it with yarn and put in a little card, thank you, in Dreams Vintage, I'll give her a shout out. I think the tissue paper that it's wrapped in has a little pink cast to it also. Okay. There should be like a drum roll for this. It looks like it might be a little smaller than my ivory one, but I knew it was like similar because my ivory one had the label down here, just like this one. Every part of the blouse is kind of see-through, so they opted not to put the label in the back of the neck because you would see it, and that's kind of an ugly look. So... It's down here in the back. If you had this tucked into a skirt or trousers, you wouldn't see that label. So there's lace, lace panels. There's also these little tucks here and glass buttons. Are they glass? No, they might not be glass, but they do have a rhinestone in them. Might be like a little celluloid plastic button. But the main thing is the buttons are all there. And I thought under a sweater, under a cardi, I'm always struggling to find like, you know, a lovely blouse that would be vintage. So I'm hoping that this fits. Love the color. Thank you in dreams vintage. Okay, next up, let's go with, for the rink or the links. Let me grab that one second. If you're new to this channel, then you will not know that I knit the entire sweater, couldn't get it on. There just wasn't enough give. The measurements were okay, but there was no give. Ripped out the whole thing. Now, ripping it out is no easy feat. There's three colors in this. It's sort of Argyle-ish, not exactly. Um, most of the rows have just two colors, but there are occasional rows like this row here, where you can see there's peach, brown, and red on the same row. There are four rows out of 
I think it's 34 rows, 34 row repeat. There's four rows that involve three colors. All the other rows are just two colors, but those two colors change. So here it's brown and red. Here it's red and peach, still red and peach. Then it goes to the three color section. Then you're brown and red. So it's always changing. Um, obviously no chart. This is a 1930s pattern, but I am happy to say that I have completely re-knit the back. Ta-da! And let me show you the original back. I haven't ripped it out yet because it's just so beautiful. I couldn't bring myself to rip out everything at once. This was the original back. So let me hold them up and you'll see the difference. This one was knit with stranded knitting. This other one I did in intarsia. So this has much more give. This has no give at all. It's like pulling on a piece of cardboard. So if I hold them one on top of the other, so you can see I have this much extra on this side and a little bit more here. So, you know, I've added a good couple of inches and I think it's gonna be just perfect. Um, I probably will base these two together and just give it a try and see if I'm in the zone. But I have already begun the front, the new front. Originally, I did a provisional cast on. I cast on here and knit up. And the reason I did it provisionally was I didn't want to have to play yarn chicken. I was pretty sure that I ordered enough of this color. Any of the colors could have been the contrasting color. But I wanted to make sure that after I knit all the pattern part that I would want to use the yarn that I had the most leftover yarn from. So I cast on here, knit up but I had live stitches that I could knit my ribbing down. Now that I'm going to rip this all out, I'm gonna keep this ribbing, but this will be the bottom of my sweater, the bottom of my waist. And I started knitting in this direction. So I can't say enough about doing these provisional casts on. It, just gives you so many more options. If you don't know how long you want something to be, you can always modify it afterwards. I see a lot of people like cutting and grafting and going through a whole rigmarole. You don't have to do so much of that. If you just provisionally cast on, then you allow yourself the possibility. When I'm all done, if I want to make this ribbing longer, like when I try it on, if I don't like where this is hitting me at my hip or my waist, I can extend my ribbing. I think this is about four inches. Vintage patterns often have very deep ribbing. This may not be deep enough, we'll see. It also depends on how much yarn you have. You know, I might not have enough. I probably will, but sometimes you may not have enough yarn to elongate that. But if you're holding on to some yarn, you can alter it and, um, perhaps make improvements. So I kind of like to do that where I can. This is how much I have done of the front now. So I'm really motoring along. You know, if you've ever had a project that you put into a timeout, it's really challenging to come back to it. Not because, not only because you don't remember where you left off, because you might take good notes and you might put some notes in Ravelry or jot some things down on a hard copy of the pattern if you have it. So it's not just that, but you lose that momentum. You, you lose that um, like zone that you get into where it's like, okay, 
I'm on a roll. I know I go this many stitches and I'm going to change color and this many stitches, I'm going to change color. And you get that rhythm thing going. If you put this away for six months or a year, it's really hard to come back to it. I have forced myself multiple times to come back to this. Just coming back to it and ripping it out was an ordeal. As I said, you know, unraveling the three colors and balling things up. And then this yarn, it's all crimpy. You have to recondition it. Hello, all I wanna do is knit. Frankly, I had a hard time coming before you today because I'm so on a roll with that violet new sweater, you know, new cast on, woohoo. I had a hard time pulling myself away to come and talk to you. So imagine the grunting and groaning of coming back to this and having to unwind it, roll it up, soak it, hang it up to dry, reball it. These projects require bobbins if, if you're going to do intarsia. So I have these vintage bobbins from the 80s. They've probably been around a lot longer than that. And I have a lot of them. I don't want to show you the back because it's, it's kind of messy. But sometimes I don't put my hands on a bobbin fast enough. So I'll just use one of these little clippy things that I salvage from the orchids that I kill. So I just wanted to show you, I have made a tremendous amount of progress on this. I still have the ribbing from the sleeves. The sleeves have a very deep ribbing. I think it's six inches. This also, I did provisional cast on. So you can see I have live stitches on this end as well as on this end for the same reason. Once I'm done knitting all the pattern to match up with the pattern on the body, if my sleeve isn't long enough or if it's too long, I can rip back. I believe that I did twisted rib here. Otherwise my ribbing never looks that even. So I, I think this is twisted rib. Not sure. You think I'd be able to tell. Anyway, this is on size Mm, the ribbing is on size one needles. The body of the sweater is on size two US. The yarn is the lovely John Arba Knit by Numbers. They are redoing that line and I think they're selling out what they have. Um, I'm not a stash person. If I was, I would be buying gobs and gobs of it because it's really soft. It has a lovely halo. I don't know if you can see this in my light. It's not too much, but it, it's it got a loveliness to it. It's not cashmere soft, but it it is mm, soft. So that's project number three. I usually don't have this many, right? And then last but not least, working off of my color mark cone of two over 30 nm lace weight extra fine merino 50 gram cone that has 730 meters i used this primarily in my genie sweater the susan crawford number with nine colors so I ordered the smallest quantity that I could, which it's not that much, 50 grams, right? But I had nine colors, 50 grams. I have a lot of each one left over. I made an entire Spencer using peach color leftovers. And I decided that I should try and use this up. So as I abhor the, the notion of having a stash, you know, my apartment's not that big. If you're a first timer, I live in a co-op apartment in Manhattan, ninth floor. 
beautiful, sunny, quiet corner apartment, set back from the street. Been here a long time and love the layout, but it is what it is. It's New York and real estate comes at a premium. So you are happy with whatever space you have. And my space is not adequate for having a wall of yarn like many of you have. Truth be told, even if I had the space, it's not my thing. I'm, I don't know, streamline is the probably the best word. I don't want excess. I, I make my husband bear with me until we're down to the bottom of the shampoo before we can buy another bottle. Because I don't want to have a shelf full of bottles of stuff that just sit there as it is early on in the pandemic when alcohol was scarce. When we finally found some, we bought two bottles. Guess what? I still have those two bottles. Nevertheless, this is the Ibiza lace shawl and scarf. I've been knitting on this since last year when I was in Shetland. I took this with me as my project to knit on the plane because it takes up no space. The cone takes up no space. And I wanted the input of some of the Shetland knitters. I wanted them to see the lace that I was knitting. And I had one woman, very experienced Shetland knitter. She said to me, never. Never would I knit that. This has pattern coming and going. A lot of the lace that they knit, there's a relief row going back, you're purling back. This has patterning on front and back and a lot of knitting through the back loop, purling through the back loop. It's probably one of the most complicated things I've knit just because of that. But it has grown, and a couple of episodes ago, I decided the best way to show you the growth was to put it around my neck and see how far it extended. So, you know, if I make an inch or two of progress, that's a lot. Now, this particular pattern instructs you to knit to the halfway mark and then cast on another piece and knit that to the halfway mark and then graph them together. So I don't know what halfway is because I don't know how much yarn I'm going to have. But now I'm, you know, getting in the zone. I have a fair amount of knitting going on here. I don't need to have this be 70 or 80 inches long, although I understand they're showing super long scarves this fall. Um, at this point, you know, whatever I get, I get. But I did want to try this idea of crafting the pattern so that the ends will both look the same instead of having just a straight across bind off. You see how the cast on is kind of a fluted edge. It's not straight. I don't know if you can get that. Anyway. I cast on, I kept this right on the same needle. So, you know, it's very light. So I just have that hanging out there. I could transfer it to something, but it doesn't bother me. Um, and I've started to knit a second piece. Now it doesn't have to meet in the middle. I think as long as I finish, I think this is a 32 row repeat. As long as I get to the 32nd row on both the left part and the right part, I'll be able to graph those like stitches together. So that's going to be a new experience for me. I haven't done a lot of grafting and I certainly haven't done anything in a place that it would be super visible. I've done three needle bind off on the shoulder, um, but you don't mind, like here's a machine made t-shirt. You don't mind when you see a shoulder seam 
it might not be so attractive to have a seam going down the middle of my scarf, but this thing is so busy, I don't think it would even be noticeable. So I would love to know what you like to knit. Is it gloves? Is it mittens, scarves, hats? Are you a sweater knitter? Please send me love notes in the comments below and tell me what it is that you're knitting on now. For a lot of people in the United States, it's summer, it's hot, it's super hot in a good part of the country. And yet some of them crazy people like me knit on wool in the summer, but you know, there's air conditioning and crazy me at the end of the summer, I picked up something that's rayon that is probably a summer project as opposed to a winter project. But you know, you have heat in the winter, you can knit with cool fibers, you have air conditioning in the summer. It doesn't matter, whatever it is, I don't care. I, I just want to be knitting, don't you? I wanted to say something about swatching because it's a topic that a lot of us have issues with. Especially new newer knitters, they don't want to spend their time swatching. They want every moment to be knitting. It reminds me when I started to play Mahjong I just wanted to play mahjong all the time. I didn't want to take breaks for lunch or uh, invite um, an alternate person to come switch out with us after every round. No, just mahjong, mahjong, mahjong all the time. I feel that way now about knitting. I just want to be knitting, don't you? So that time for swatching, yes, it's like, can't live with it, can't live without it. We got to do it. We know we got to do it. Sometimes I use the sleeve as my swatch. I'll start to knit the sleeve and see, you know, how's it working out because the width of it is comparable to what I would knit for a swatch anyway. And then after I've done a couple of inches, if I see that I'm not getting gauge or I don't like how the fabric looks, okay, I'll rip it out. But there's a 50% chance that it's going to be spot on. And then I already have that much of my sweater knit. So today though, I'm going to tell you about the nightmare that I had with this rayon yarn that just didn't behave anything like wool or cotton or anything that I've knit with. I think because it sticks to itself like Velcro, it had additional problems and what a nightmare. Ugh. Also the, the gauge, it wasn't until I really started knitting the pattern and the width on different size needles that I could get like a really good estimate of the gauge. Knitting something four or five inches wide I wasn't going to see how much stretch I was getting. But once I got to something that's like 20 inches wide, is it 18 or is it 21? I can stretch this and make it be either of those. So I really had to knit the whole thing to be able to see what was going to work and what wasn't. I'm wondering if that's the reason why a lot of patterns call for knitting the back first. If you have any glitches in the back, like these little loops that I was complaining about, then it's in the back and I have time to modify. You know, it's at the bottom of the back where I don't think too many people are going to be staring at that part of my back. Most people are going to be looking where their eyes at eye level to their eyes. So this part, I want to be very neat because when people look at me, they're seeing that too. So by the time you knit the whole back and the bottom of the front up to the top of the front, this is the last part that you're knitting in a lot of vintage patterns before you go onto the sleeves. You already have a lot of experience with the yarn and with the pattern. So if you know some other reason of why we knit the back first in many patterns that are knit flat, please comment. Inquiring minds would like to know. It reminds me of my stepmother many years ago. She worked with an interior decorator to 
furnish their apartment. And she was shown a very nice size piece of fabric, velvet fabric that had a paisley pattern. During World War II, when she was stationed in what was then Persia, now Iran, she became very fond of paisley designs. And she saw this paisley pattern and thought she would just love to have that on her sofa. Well, she saw this much of the fabric. When the sofas were delivered with the fabric on it, she just about had a nervous breakdown. The pattern repeat was something like 60 inches wide. So she thought that this pattern that she saw was going to repeat, 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 but that little bit, she didn't see again until it was like the next cushion over. It can be very, very deceptive. And I felt the same thing was happening here. Just to have four or five inches of this really wasn't going to tell me the whole story. But okay, I ripped out this quantity at least a dozen times. That's several days of knitting for me. But at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but I want something that is going to look good when I put it on. I don't want something where these all these loops are hanging out all over the place. I just thought that would be like a hot mess. And I can't do that, right? I'm a knitting podcaster. I have to put out good product for my audience. If you've been enjoying this video, of course, don't forget to subscribe and like and all of that and comment. But if you like this, you're apt to like some of my previous podcasts. So I'm going to leave a playlist up here in the corner. Feel free to go check out any of those. And I hope you enjoy a lot more show and tell. Bye for now.